come I always have to follow Grace after she's been like coughing on the microphone? I had to do that in youth. I had to use the microphone right after Grace like coughed all over it. And now, thank you, Grace. No, thank you, Grace. Really, thank you, Grace. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, what an amazing God you are. God who loves us. God who died for us. God who heals us and brings us wholeness. Lord, we know you're here in this place. Lord, we ask that you would speak, that you would bring wholeness into lives that are broken, into lives that are physically sick and ill. Like grace, we ask that you would bring wholeness, but also into lives that are emotionally, spiritually broken, that you would bring wholeness. So Spirit, we know that you are here working, and we trust that, Spirit, you will work, that you will speak to us, that the words that I speak will not be my words, but will be your words. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. No matter how much things change, some things just continue to remain the same. Much like Christians today, the Christians of Peter's time struggled with how to live out their faith. They struggled, struggled with what does it mean that their Savior is alive, that their Savior is risen. And some 2,000 years later today, I still hear that question. So what? So what? What does it mean to us that Jesus is alive? What does it mean to us that Jesus died on the cross, that he's resurrected and alive? It's a question that was asked some 2,000 years ago that's been asked ever since and that's still asked today. What does it mean that Jesus is risen and alive? I think the best place to find that answer is obviously by looking in Scripture. But I think there's one person in Scripture who's probably a bigger and better authority than just about anyone else. Coming from the mouth of Peter, the guy who was there when Jesus was turning water into, or not, when Jesus was starting his ministry. The guy who was there and left Jesus aside when, when the guards took him away. But now the guy out in the streets proclaiming the gospel, writing letters to Christian churches encouraging them. Who better to answer the question than Peter? So what did it mean to Peter that Christ is risen? Peter tells us part of what it meant. In verse 17 he says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's works impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Peter makes it clear that what he's about to say is for those who call themselves Christians, who call themselves believers, followers of Jesus. So he qualifies what he says by beginning, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially. And please don't get caught up on the man, it's people, women, men, humanity, who judges everyone's works impartially. This doesn't apply to those who don't believe in Christ yet. This applies to those who follow him, who call him Lord and Savior. This applies to us. For those that call ourselves Christians, he says, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Live your lives as strangers. Strangers. I think if we read through this quickly, we miss that word. Live your life as strangers. Peter's telling us we are strangers here on earth. Earth isn't our home. We're just visiting for a little while. For those who believe in Christ, our home is in heaven, not here. We are strangers, foreigners in this, on this world, because this isn't where we belong. This is not home. As followers of Christ, we belong in heaven. That's home. But for now, we're here. We're here living on this earth. And so while we're here living on this earth, we're to live as strangers here in reverent fear. If you read some of the other translations, English Standard Version translates it, while in exile. While we're away from our home, while we are in this foreign land, in this foreign place, we are strangers here. And so while you are here, live as a stranger don't adapt to this world. Don't become like this world. Don't do what this world does and just accept it. But live as strangers, as people who don't belong, 
as people who are out of place. Not as people who are completely out of place, but as people who are new to this place, for whom this isn't home. Because as Christians, this place isn't home. As Christians, our home is in heaven. So Peter tells us to live as strangers with reverent fear. The Greek word that's used for fear is phobos, which you guys probably figure out is the root for phobia. But phobia is usually just fear, like some irrational fear. But phobos isn't just fear. Phobos in Greek isn't just fear. I, I like the way it's translated here. It's reverent fear. When scripture talks about fear of the Lord, it's not that we're supposed to be scared of God, but we're supposed to have a reverent awe of God. It's talking about a reverence for God, a holy awe, an understanding that compared to God, we're nothing. Compared to a holy God who's up here, we're way down here. And that's how we're supposed to live while we're way down here. As strangers, not getting sucked up into the things of this world, not becoming like this world, not measuring success and failure by the standards this world uses, but living by God's standards, living with the holy reverence for God. We're to live in this world without being of this world. But too often, as we live in this world, a lot of times we tend to start to become of this world. Maybe, maybe, sometimes you feel out of place here. And maybe there's a reason. Maybe you don't quite feel like you belong on earth. And maybe it's because we don't really belong on earth. We're strangers here. Our home is in heaven. But on the flip side, Maybe you feel way too comfortable here. Maybe everything is nice and comfy. You feel right at home. You kick up your feet. Everything's just the way you wanted. Maybe that's a warning that we've gotten too comfortable. That rather than living as strangers in this foreign place, this, we've started to make this world our home. We're to live as strangers with the reverent awe of God. When I was younger, I used to always think, I, I want a job that I get to travel a lot. I want a job where I get to go, like, fly around the world and do whatever, all these things. And the, the place that I work would pay for my travels and pay for my hotel and everything. As I get older, traveling gets harder. And now with a wife and kid, I don't want to travel. I'd much rather stay at home. Home is so much more, more, so much more comfortable, so much more peaceful. Hotel rooms, retreat cabins, someone else's house, no matter how nice, no, no matter how nice the place is, no matter how well the place is decked out, I can't wait to go home. I can't wait to get home. We should be living with that sort of anticipation. We should be living with that sort of excitement where we can't wait to get home because this is not our home. As the ESV says, we're living here in exile. We're living here for a time. But a time is coming when we're going home. So while we're here, live here as strangers in this world. With a reverent fear, with a reverent awe of God. The other thing it means, being that our, that our Lord is risen is that our home is in heaven because our lives have been paid for. Our lives have been bought at a price, at a very steep price. Peter says in verse 18, 19, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. When I was younger, I used to be a huge wrestling fan. Back in the day, I used to watch wrestling growing up. I used to do wrestling moves. I like pile drove a kid, drop kicked a kid, got like Bundy splashed by some other kid. But I used to be a huge wrestling fan. And back in the day, there was a guy named the Million Dollar Man. Ironically, this guy ended up becoming a Christian preacher. But this guy's gimmick was 
he said, no, everybody has a price for the million dollar man. And he would go around and like flash money and get people to do stupid things by give, offering them money, saying everybody has a price. And in a sense, he was right. In a sense, we do have a price. But that price isn't gold or silver or money. That price was the precious blood of Jesus. The precious blood of Christ shed, spilt for us. That's what it costs God to ransom us. That's what it costs God to bring us out of slavery from sin, to bring us out of that separation from him and bring us back into relationship with him. The blood of his son. That price was paid by Christ on the cross through his blood. That's why our home is not here. No one here has paid for us the way Christ has paid for us. Our home is in heaven because Christ paid for us with his blood. And that's where Christ is. Christ paid for us with his precious blood. That's why we belong to him. In many cultures, if you save somebody's life, your life belongs to them until that person repays the debt. Usually repaying the debt means saving their life. Christ saved our lives. Now our lives belong to him. Our lives had a price, a very, very steep price. A price so high that gold, silver, money could not buy it. A price so high that only the precious blood of Christ could buy it. Only by the blood of Christ are we redeemed. That means our bodies don't belong to us anymore. Our bodies belong to Christ. That means we need to take care of our bodies. We need to treat our bodies as the temple of God because that's what they are. They are the temple of God. We need to treat our bodies with respect, not abusing it, not using it for our pleasure, but using our bodies for God because it was by the blood of Christ the precious blood of Christ that we've been redeemed. Along with that, along with us being redeemed by the blood of Christ, there's another aspect to that that I don't think we think about nearly enough. We may hear that we've been bought by the blood of Christ, but I don't, there's another aspect of that that I don't think we think about or consider nearly enough. And that's that Christ shed his blood for all humanity. Not all of humanity accepts that Christ shed his blood for them, but Christ shed his blood for all of humanity. Everybody, every single person. In other words, Christ believed that every single person was worthy of him dying, was worthy of him shedding his blood for them, of him shedding his precious blood. So then, if Christ deemed everybody worthy of his precious blood, doesn't that mean we should deem them worthy too? Doesn't that mean we should deem each other worthy as people worthy of Christ's blood? And if we deem each other as worthy of Christ's blood, shouldn't that change the way we interact with each other? Shouldn't that change the way we talk to each other? I'm not just talking about with our family or with friends or with people we like. I'm talking about with everyone. Because Christ died for you, for me, for our family, for our friends, for our enemies, for the stranger on the street begging for money, for that kid we yell at at McDonald's for messing up our order. Shouldn't we be treating each other, everyone, as someone worthy of the blood of Christ? Whether, whether everybody has accepted the blood of Christ or not, Christ thought them worthy enough to die on the cross for them, to shed his blood for them. So then should we not be treating each other as worthy of the blood of Christ? Should we not be treating each other as special, made in the image of God? As special, worthy, of the precious blood of Christ. 